Hi, I'm Flip Nicklin. Welcome to Humpback Chronicles. Uh, today, uh, the interview, uh, the interview in his words, is with Ed Lyman. And Ed Lyman has uh, just a great job. I and mean, we, we all work with whales. We think we do something that's good for them and, and, and good for whales in general. But Ed actually sets whales free as being in charge of disentanglement with the sanctuary. Ed's job helps whales where you see a direct result each time. A, a great guy and a great job. Uh, Ed's work has not just been important for the whales themselves, but I think for the whole community that works with and cares for whales, the uh, whale researchers, whale watchers, the Coast Guard, and the community at large has all gotten together more closely, and, and Ed's work coordinating those efforts to help whales has been a big part of that. But the whole thing with these interviews is not for me to tell you about Ed. It's to hear from Ed himself. So, uh, hi, Ed. How are you doing? Uh, maybe the first question is, how did you get involved with whales to begin with? And especially, what brought you to Maui to work with disentanglement of whales here? Aloha, Flip. Um, I'm doing fine. Uh, thanks for asking. But, and thanks for having me on Humpback Chronicles. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, boy, great question. How did I get started working with whales and the disentanglement effort, especially here in Hawaii? How did I get here? It was a circuitous route, by the way, and I have to admit to everyone that I didn't plan on it. It just sort of happened. Actually, if we go back, I mean, I, I have to admit to everyone, and probably a lot of people, folks don't know this, is I actually started, my, well, my master's thesis was on muskrats, not whales. So these little, you know, one foot long rodents, I was doing island biogeography on some islands in a marine lab off the coast of Maine, so back east. And, but, you know, here's the thing, while I was working with the muskrats, I got my first experience with the whales out there on the marine lab. And one of those experiences was actually a near rescue. Um, the director had gotten a call about an entangled humpback whale, I think the humpback whale's name was Al, and it was off Rye, New Hampshire, about five miles away, and so he said, Ed, you're my best diver. Get your gear, let's go cut that whale free. You know, it's a lot, what a lot of people would try to do, well-intentioned, uh, take what they have, diving gear, uh, use that to cut a whale free. Now, we've since learned that that's not the best way of doing it. But in any event, we, I was almost there. I mean, I could see the cluster of boats around the animal, um, and all of a sudden over the radio comes this call, okay? And it was uh, something to this effect. It was like Shoals Marine Lab, Shoals Marine Lab, this is the Center for Coastal Studies. We've been authorized and trained to do this type of work. Please stand down. And, and we did. Now here's the thing. I mean, here's that near rescue where I'm almost able to jump in the water and cut that whale free. Who knows how that would have worked out. But that Center for Coastal Studies, I ended up working for them about eight years later. Didn't make the connection right away, but they're a little nonprofit uh, whale research, whale rescue organization on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I was hired not to cut whales free. I was hired to coordinate their stranding efforts there, especially in the wintertime, and run their boat and help captain it um, and all, maintain it. But uh, what was happening around that time is the strandings were decreasing, so they weren't getting the mass strandings they had been getting, but the entanglements were increasing. Um, humpback whales, some minke whales, but especially the North Atlantic right whales, a critically endangered species of whale. And so, you know, whereas Stormy and David, Dr. Stormy Mayo and David Matilla were the pioneers uh, doing this type of work, uh, had maybe cut free about 10 whales at that point in time. And of course, it was John Lean up off of Newfoundland working with disentangling whales up there with fishermen. Uh, these were the pioneers. And with this change occurring, I ended up being the first apprentice, sort of their early apprentice there, and kind of, kind of pulled into the effort. And I know. For years there, I mean, we were super busy, especially with, again, with the right whales. They were flying us up and down the coast. Um, I think we had 20, 30 responses in some years, uh, maybe cutting 8, 10, 12 whales free. And things got really busy, and, and we realized a couple things. We learned a lot in those years. Uh, we, one, that you, we weren't going to solve the problem by cutting, you know, whales free one by one. And two, it was going to take a lot more people to do it. Uh, we needed to build that network. And I think with that in mind, I, I know I made a shift there. I, I changed gears and, and wanted to address the source of the problem a little bit more. And, and part of that was working with fishermen. And I started 
doing that with the state of Massachusetts and you know going out in boats and learning their techniques and got a lot of bait bag duty there by the way uh, but you know one thing that I learned just in that interval of time is that they knew my history they knew I worked with whales and it cut whales free they would ask me questions all the time that I couldn't always answer and I realized that part of that answering those questions came from the response itself you know gaining information towards prevention that was the other goal of cutting a whale free well, Stormy Mayo and David had mentioned the same and of course also what's happening around this time is Dave Matilla has moved on as well and he's taken a job as the research coordinator at the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary and he he's looking to build a network response here as well in Hawaii and he reaches out to me and says Ed can you help me out can you come down here to Hawaii and lend a hand and between what I just told you trying to you know increase the scope gain information get back into response and wanting to help David I took the job that was 18 years ago uh, ended up staying uh, David has since moved on to, and again that theme of building a greater network a better a greater team a, a broader team he's with the International Whaling Commission now uh, and has gone more global in that regard. I've stayed on and just worked with a great community here in Hawaii. Um, boy, the, the Aloha spirit, a bunch of uh, just, I, you know, a bunch of dedicated, caring people that, uh, you know, working together um, and gaining information, cutting whales free. We've done very well over the years. It's just been an honor. So there you go, a little history there. Uh, thanks, Ed. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, 2005 and how the work you did then helped pull people together uh, in West Maui. This is like one of our first, it was like the, maybe the third effort we've had in Hawaii. And if memory serves me, that was a sub-adult humpback whale. It was entangled in, in what looked like marine debris and ended up being marine debris. It was just off uh, Lahaina. And I think some tour companies called it in first. I think it was Pacific Whale Foundation, Ultimate Whale Watch, and then uh, you or Whale Trust, as well as uh, Center for Whale Studies. You guys were out there and, and was it, were able to run over and, and stand by the animal, monitor the animal for us, hold on to it, so to speak. Um, I think everyone's aware that these animals end up being large needles in a very large haystack out there, the Pacific Ocean. We lose them. So that was great. And by the way, you guys really set the stage, um, set the example of being first responders. And again, this was very early on. Here we've got the tour companies calling it in, uh, finding the animal, uh, the whale research community um, does the monitoring, helps us get the first assessment, and the documentation. And then in this case, uh, the sanctuary, uh, Dave Matilla and myself uh, having that lead role on the response side and getting a ride from the U.S. Coast Guard. I remember our boat at the time was only like 21 feet long, and here we were launching a 17-foot a inflatable. Uh, didn't work that well. So the Coast Guard lent a hand, brought us out there, we worked as a team, and uh, you guys passed on the information, and we started figuring out what we needed to do. I remember being embarrassed on this one, on this response, because I think I threw that grapple like 20 times before I got a hold of that whale. Uh, everyone probably knows we need to gain access to the whale to cut them free. And we're using an old whaling technique and modification of that. Uh, you know, instead of throwing the harpoon, we're throwing the grapple to get a hold of our whale, being the entanglement. It just took a while. And in my defense, by the way, it was, you know, there was a lot of gear on that whale. It was a mouth entanglement, flipper wraps, but all the gear pretty much was on the right side of the whale. It wasn't really trailing that far behind us, in my defense. But eventually, we did get a hold of the whale. Um, and started kegging it uh, and again instead of adding kegs or barrels we added poly balls couldn't get the whale to slow down I remember that though we did get it to stay at the surface and that definitely helped and I remember at one point David holding on to the you know to the line attached to the whale and bending it over the bow of the inflatable and we're getting our Nantucket sleigh ride and at one point we figured out we could tack our way up on the right side of the animal and the animal was actually moving so fast that it was towing us in such a way that if we put the the tow line on the left side of the boat, it would the boat would kind of angle up on the right side of the animal, and that put me in position. And you know, we have these hook knives on the end of long poles that I could reach out. And yes, the eye was right next to the mouth that we wanted to cut that line coming out of the right side of the mouth. 
uh, and it shied away a couple times, but eventually we were able to hook in there, make the cuts, line sh gear shut off the whale, and then we were able to collect it. And I know you've gotten some great pictures of us with the gear and, and launching the boat and, and so on. That response, that one was a big help there. Uh, now we took that gear, by the way, back to the sanctuary and, and it was everything. It was indeed marine debris. I mean, there was like 20 different line types there, different types of net and line. I think one of them was like 20 feet of like two inch diameter hawser type line, like a tow line or something. So uh, really indicative of some of the gear we can get off these whales. And, and you know, since then, again, that was such a great example of people working together here in Hawaii. But since then, that, that has just grown. I mean, let me tell you, I mean, I can give you so many examples. You know, for instance, we were talking about the tour companies finding the whales, very typical, you know, the number of boats out there. And pretty much just about every boat off of Maui has helped us if they've had the opportunity. But I can remember a case, you know, where we got the call and I ran down to the boat and uh, we turned the batteries on, put the VHF radio on, and I overheard the boats talking amongst themselves, the tour boats. And they were saying things like, boy, you know, Sanctuary's going to be about an hour here before they get out here. Uh, we're going to have to take turns. I'll take the, you know, I'm going to monitor the whale for about 30 minutes and I'm going to have to go back to Lahaina. But I've got so-and-so behind me going to take over and then after that it'll be this other boat. Um, and it was just, man, it brought a smile to my face to hear that on the radio. You know, I wasn't asking, they were doing it themselves. And uh, back to you guys, back to Whale Trust and some of the other whale researchers. I remember a case, I think uh, Center for Whale Studies was on this one as well, uh, where we had a, a male humpback whale, and we're trying to find it and, and grapple into the gear that was trailing behind it, having a challenging time, by the way. And all of a sudden, I think it was... Megan, I think it was Dr. Megan Jones, who got on the radio and said, hey, everyone, stop. I hear a whale singing. And sure enough, it was our whale. And so we're all looking around for it. And here's a case where we needed Jim Darling, uh, Dr. Jim Darling to help us out. But um, we, you know, I was, I don't know, I, myself, I was, I had my mask on, my scuba mask, and I'm leaning over the boat. Uh, actually, at one point, I fell in. Uh, but eventually, we found, found that male singing, sitting there, about, I don't know, about 40 feet down, and the gear was just floating off of its tail, and we were able to lower the grapple down. It's like the first time I have jigged a whale. I actually lowered the grapple down, hooked in. Of course, as soon as he felt the pressure, he, off he ran again, and eventually we got some of the gear, gear off the whale. Um, another case, this will also involve uh, Whale Trust and Center for Whale Studies and the Dolphin Institute, was a female humpback whale. And at one point, I remember all a bunch of males came in. She became the nuclear animal in a competition group, and we had to wait for the, wet, the males to, to disperse, and eventually we got her free of the gear. Um, but, oh, here's a case. Uh, this was a, case, a bunch of tail wraps on a, on a young humpback whale. This was involved the Dolphin Institute, and we're going to start bringing in the different state and federal agencies here, because this one involved the Division of Aquatic Resources. Russell Spark helped us out, and I, I remember this case because we got the whale free, and we've since seen, we've had sightings of it. We've had people, you know, report it back to us based on the fluke ID, but that whale's doing fine. It's actually on my business card. Uh, just so many examples. Uh, oh, ocean safety was involved in one. You know, the lifeguards. We had a, an entangled whale that, uh, it was actually not even rope, it was cable. And uh, they monitored the whale with the jet skis and then brought us out cable cutters so it could free the whale. So. And just over the years, again, you know, I can't name everyone, but uh, I already mentioned Coast Guard. They've helped us out a number of times. NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement, they've taken their enforcement hat off and put the response hat on, lent a hand where they could. No fisheries, of course. Um, and just, and again, the State uh, Division of Aquatic Resources and DLNR, Department of Land and Natural Resources, all have lent a hand over the time. And back to the tour companies and just been spectacular uh, getting all that help. And it's just... It just that aloha spirit. I mean, I, I've been amazed. Um, it's just been great. Thanks, Ed. I uh, I can't believe how much better uh, things are and how much uh, more cooperation there is between all the different groups. Uh, maybe uh, talk a little bit about where we've come from there, uh, how it's changed over the last decade and a half, and especially what's been going on because of COVID and the pandemic. Uh, what are you doing now? 
Well, Flip, uh, good question. Uh, what has changed over the last couple decades as far as the response goes? And Well, beyond me having a lot more gray hair, um, the tools we've used uh, have changed, the technology. Uh, we're using drones more, and we have different, you know, better knives, and we've got uh, cameras on the end of poles that help us cut the whales free. So there's that side, and then there's the back to the network side. We've got many more organizations, um, groups of people helping us out. The network has grown in that in that regard, the scope of it, and it's men, you know, it's the foundation of the effort. So there's that. Um, I have learned that there's a lot of factors influencing the, the rate of entanglements, the threat itself, and our response to it. And I can give you a couple examples. I mean, some of these are fairly recent. Uh, one is um, well, back a couple years ago, around 2015-16, uh, we were noticing some changes in the rate of sightings here. We'll call it that. I mean, it might have been the actual numbers of whales, but here around the Hawaiian Islands, breeding cabin grounds. Uh, and we think or thought that was part of uh, environmental changes that were occurring at the time, affecting the animals. And that, that definitely influenced the entanglement threat and the, and the rate there, some form of fa fashion. Uh, some of the things we saw were, at first, you know, the, the number of reports were staying the same, but there was a shift from whales carrying gear from Alaska to a shift to whales being reported with gear from British Columbia, Canada. Okay, so there was one change there. It was uh, more near-shore gear versus offshore set gear. There was more mouth entanglements occurring in that time frame. And all these, again, a hypothesis was that it was a result of changes in the habitat use of the whales, maybe due to environmental change and, and shifts in prey that caused these shifts and caused a change in the, in the entanglement threat itself that we were seeing. Okay? Now, the other example I'll give you is even more recent. It's the global pandemic. I don't know how that might have changed the actual entanglement threat. It probably did. There's some examples there. But uh, really, it's a big, it's a big uh, well, it's a good example of how it changes the effort side of things. You know, there was fewer tour companies out there, fewer trips. Uh, on the research side, a lot of the researchers weren't getting out or reducing their trips. We, we certainly were at the Humpback Whale Sanctuary. So there was less eyes on the water and less reporting. And in fact, our reporting base changed. It was not so much the tour companies and the whale researchers. It was people on kayaks and, and stand-up boards because the effort changed a little bit. And they weren't, we didn't make them part of the network as much. So we definitely, it was a lesson for me, again, this change and how dynamic everything is, even on the effort side, um, things have changed. So we're gonna reach out to that community that much more and make them part of the team as well. So uh, back to the foundation of the effort, uh, one big thing we can do is that whole community effort. It can, it can be very broad. So, yeah, good question. Well, that's great, Ed. Uh, probably the most important question and what I want to ask in all of these interviews is, what is the question I didn't ask that you want to respond to? What do you want to tell us that we don't know that we should know about Ed Lyman and the work that you do and the things you care about? Well, Flip, we've covered a lot here. Um, we've got everything from how I got started to the importance of the community for this particular um, threat, entanglement threat. But one thing I don't think we've covered yet is the accomplishments. Um, boy, we've done really well. We've, we've removed gear from 34 large whales, most of those humpback whales, over the years. Uh, almost certainly saved m most of those animals, for sure. Uh, we've moved over 12,000 feet of measurable line and. As an example of what we've learned, uh, we've identified over 70 sets of gear over the years. So just some quick examples there. But you know, as cool as that is, I think entanglement response here is just, is just one of many examples of the community working together here in Hawaii. I think there's many more. I mean, look at the research community working together and hey, whale tales. That's a great example of uh, people coming together to share information, to do the education outreach. So I think many of those examples are out there. And I think, you know, we were talking about the changes. It's, we threw out examples there, and I think there's going to be more of that and, and how that challenges us and, and how that affects the animals directly but indirectly through maybe the other threats that are out there. You know, I talked about changes in the environment maybe change, affecting entanglement threat. I think there's more of that to come, and we're going to have to work together. And, you know, humpback whales, they're, they're our canaries in a coal mine. They're one of our canaries, and they're a big one. And I think we're just going to have to work together even more and for their own sake, for the whale's sake, for their protection conservation, but for our sake and for the for the broader conservation goal here. So I think I'll stop at that and, and just say, yeah, we're gonna, our work is just starting. 
and we'll have to keep working together. So again, thanks for having me on Humpback Chronicles, and, and it's again been a pleasure. Take care, Flip. Aloha. Thank you, Ed, and uh, and thank you all, and especially thank you for your support. Bye bye.